right now, as we're here in your presence, we pray, O King of Kings, that you may come and delight in our presence, O King of Glory. In, your word tells us that you dwell in the praises of your people, so we welcome you here today, O King of Kings, and we ask that we may encounter you, O King of Glory, and we pray, O King of Kings, that we may not leave this place the same way we've entered, O King of Kings. We thank you and we that everything we say, every song that we sing will be for the glory of your name, O King of Kings. We exalt your name on high. We will lift your name on high, Jesus. For there is nobody like you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.
can sing with your voice.
Thank you, Lord. Give a mighty hand clap to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I just want us to take a moment in the presence of God. You know, the psalmist says in the book of Psalms 121 that I looked up to the hills. Where will my help come from? And he says, my help comes from the Lord. Our help, our victory will come from the Lord. And we've just seen that his unfailing love is stronger than the mountain, deeper than the oceans. The Bible says again in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, I will read from verse 14 to 16, that seeing then that he, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. It says, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was in all points tempted, yet without sin. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. I want you to go before your God. He loves you. He cares for you. He knows you're lying down and you're rising up. He knows the intent of your heart. He knows where you're paining most. And he knows what you need right now. And the Bible says, approach his throne of grace and mercy with boldness. Our heavenly Father, we come before your throne this afternoon. We worship you. We praise you. We lift your name high. And we declare that victory belongs to you. For it's in you, Lord, that we live, move, and have our being. For without you, Jesus, we cannot make any step in life. And that is why we join our hands, hearts, faith together to celebrate the Almighty God, the everlasting Father, the one who has no shadow of change in him, who reigns, who cares. Oh, Jesus, you alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. We give you praise. And today you are here. You could be watching me online, and probably you have a heavy heart. You are struggling. You are wrestling with a circumstance. I want to introduce to you this man called Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, our healer, our deliverer, our provider, the way maker, the rock of ages. He is the source of our refuge. The Bible says that in him we live, move, and have our being. Father God, I bring those people to you, Lord. I pray for your healing power to flow through their veins right now. I pray that, Lord God, they will encounter the joy that comes from you the peace that you give, the peace that we cannot derive from the things of this world, but the peace that you give, O oh Lord, the peace that surpasses all human understanding to rule and reign over those souls, over our hearts, to right now take eminent in our lives, to take place 
in every soul, every life that is right under this roof. And I pray that Jesus, no one is going to go out through these doors the same way they came in. I pray that Jesus, you will touch every flesh. You will reach out to the deepest part of their lives and speak the word that no man has ever spoken or can ever speak. And bring life where there is lifeless. Bring hope where there is hopelessness. Bring joy where there is sadness. Bring dancing where there is sorrow because you can do it Lord and only you can do it we give you praise we give you glory and honor for only you deserve it in Jesus' mighty name we pray and believe give a mighty hand clap to Jesus praise the Lord thank you worship team thank you Donna, Miguel and the team the band and everyone that is serving today God bless you you are all most welcome in the house of the Lord. Thank you for coming. Turn to somebody near you and give them a, a fist bump. Tell them you are most welcome in the house of God. Powerful. There is no better place to be like being in the presence of the Lord. My names are Peter Hunzingoma, and I serve here at CLA as the lead pastor. And I would like to say it's an honor and a delight for me to host the service today. And we want to thank you. We want to welcome our online audience. Hope you are already enjoying and more is yet to come because we believe in a God that never runs out. He has everything that everybody needs. Doesn't matter where you are, God can meet you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And if you are here and it's your first time to come and fellowship with us here at Christian Life Assembly, we cherish visitors. You can shoot your hands wherever you are. The ushers are ready to reach out to you and uh, welcome you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. God bless you. We love you. Thank you for coming to fellowship with us. The ushers are coming to you with two cards. One is an information card. The other one is just a bookmark that has our programs. It's really brief. So at the end of the service, you will make your way to our hospitality room. There is a lovely team that will, will be uh, uh, there waiting to love on you and to answer any question that you may have and whatever information you may need to know. Praise the Lord. Shall we have the church news? Hello, church. I greet you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Big, big hug to everybody. My name is Martha Julian, and this is the church news. Ladies, as we start our new week, let's kickstart things off with our prayer altar, which happens every Monday, 5 a.m. at the break of day, 1 p.m. at your lunch break, and as we wind the day, 10 p.m. Remember, the ladies' prayer altar happens online. This is to the entire CLA family. Set aside your Tuesday evenings from 6 to 8 p.m. and join us for an immersive experience in the presence of the Lord. Come join us as we seek the presence of the Lord. Your soul will be refreshed and your heart will be lifted. Youth and young adults, hello! I'm talking about the backbone of the church. Let's meet every Wednesday in the morning at our usual place, Prayer Stone, from 5.15 to 6 a.m. Come for your double dose of spiritual rejuvenation. As a cell-based church, we take our faith every Wednesday evenings to the streets of our neighborhoods in cells as we gather to share and spread the love of Christ in our communities. Calling upon all men of faith for the men's prayer altar that happens every Thursday online from 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. Don't miss out on your weekly power dose. Your life depends on it. The Ministry of Intercession invites everyone with a prayer burden to join forces every Friday from 6 to 8 p.m. Come, 
Let us make mention of the Lord and give him no rest until he makes Jerusalem a praise on the earth. To all our university students, get your fire ignited in the Lord every Saturday from 5.30 to 8 p.m. and burn for Christ all week as you shine the light of truth to those around you. For more information about our weekly events, please check the information desk at the back. Thank you for watching Church News. My name is Martha Julian. I serve with 119 Leadership and the Tuesday Prayer Ministry. God bless you and have a peaceful week. Let's appreciate the AV team. That is beautiful. Thank you. I just have one verbal to add. Uh, man enough is back. If you are seated near to a man, tell them that man enough is back. <laughs> I know, yeah. So Man Enough is a discipleship program for all men. So if you've not gone through that, this is your opportunity. They are starting on 3rd May, and uh, I can see uh, Brother Benji at the back. Hope you are there to receive them. So registration is happening. The rest of the details, you can always get them right there. Praise the Lord. And now we are going to get into another session of worshiping God with our substance. We are going to give to God. They are going to give, uh, project some details right here at the back. And the ushers are also going to go around with the bags. So you feel free to drop in your tithe or your offering. And uh, then I will come later to introduce our guest preacher. Let me pray for our offerings. Father God, we are grateful for this yet another day that you have given to us. We want to thank you for even uh, the strength that you've given us to be able to make wealth. And want to pray that, Lord Jesus, you will bless every hand that has brought in your house so that your work can continue to progress. We pray that, Lord, you bless the works of your hand you protect them from the devourer and continue to enlarge, O oh God, the boundaries of their territories. Grant them your favor. And for those that do not have what to give in your house, I pray that, Lord, you open doors and bless them as well. And at the end of it all, may your name continue to be lifted high. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
do the last verse uh, together. hand clap to Jesus. Hallelujah. That is our God. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Let's thank you so much. Let's appreciate them once again. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you for the work that you're doing and everyone that is serving in the house of God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That is our God. Amen. He will never fail. And if he is on your side, you will not fail as well. You will never fail. Praise the Lord. Uh, together with me, uh, let's welcome our guest preacher, Brother Lambert. Lambert Bariho. Wonderful man of God. <laughs> Lambert is uh, 
is, is, is a board chair for Wellspring Academy. But at the same time, he leads RL ministry. He has blessed us since morning. And I'm hoping that you will be blessed as well. You are most welcome to share what God has laid upon your heart. God bless you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Pastor Peter. Um, it's a privilege and an honor for me to be with you this morning or this afternoon. Uh, now that I have been here the whole morning, um, but I'm really thankful to be with you today. And as we start this time together, I um, want to express that I stand with all of us Rwandis as we commemorate the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. And um, I stand especially with the genocide survivors who lost their loved ones in a horrible, different manners. I stand with you and I pray with you that God of all comfort would be with you and would bring healing to your hearts as we commemorate in this period. My name is Lambert, as he said, and um, I'm married to Catherine and we have two kids. They just left, they were in the second service. And um, we have the privilege of leading a ministry called LR Ministries Rwanda, which is a ministry that um, helps people on the journey of healing and restoration, but also of discipleship, because healing and discipleship to us, it's one thing, it goes together. And um, I fellowship at a revelation of Omega Church, which used to be at um, uh, Rubangura, now we are at um, Kagugu. So that's where I fellowship. And this morning, my topic that I will be sharing on is the church as the agent, as the agent of healing. That's the, sum, the topic of the sermon this afternoon. The church, the agent, the, the, the agent of healing. That's what we will be looking at. And um, referring to the church, we will refer to the church in two ways. Number one, we will look at the church as the body of Christ. And as such, it will be about you, about me, because we are all part of the body of Christ. We are brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. So whenever we refer to church, we will be referring to that in one aspect. But on the other hand, we will also be referring to the church as a local church, as a community, as an institution, like CLA and many other churches across this city of Kigari. And um, any time I refer to hearing this morning, I know there are many ways you can define the hearing, but this morning I will be referring to hearing as the restoration of God's order in someone's life so that he or she may be able to fulfill God's purpose on his life or on her life. So I, there are many ways you can define it, but that's what I will be referring to, that it is the restoration of God's order in my life, in your life, so that you are healed and be able to go and fulfill God's purpose on your life. And why would I define hearing in that way this morning? As we all know, God is the creator. He created everything we see, what we know, and what we are yet to know. And part of what he created is mankind. He created us in his own image to have his likeness so that we may go and rule and reign and be his representative. But as we all know, we messed up. Instead of agreeing with God, we chose to agree with the enemy and therefore sinned against our God, which ushered in a lot of troubles for mankind, for the world today. 
And the, the main consequence of our sin is brokenness in the world. Even when you go back to Genesis chapter 3, you can see that there was brokenness. Number one, in our relationship with God. When God visited them, what did they do? They ran away. Because there was brokenness in the relationship of mankind and God. But not there only, they were also brokenness in our relationship with one another. I'm always amazed how in a short period, Adam changed to, from referring to his wife as a bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, and then she became that woman. Just in a short period, because sin had come. Brokenness of relationship between us and each other. But also there was brokenness with our own self. Man was naked and it was okay to him. But this time he became aware that he was naked and he felt ashamed. And the Bible tells us that he started sowing fig leaves. They are terrible leaves to make clothes from. But we still attempt it. But also there was brokenness between mankind and the environment. If you read Genesis chapter 3, you will see the consequence of our sin. When God say, you are bringing a curse on the ground and the many other things that followed. So this morning, I'm going to be sharing that the church is the agent of healing. In, and I will use seven points that I want to talk about to illustrate or to make the point that God looks at the church and sees the agent of healing in this broken world. Point number one will be that healing is central to the mission of Jesus. Point number two, it will be that healing is central to the Great Commission. And point number three will be that healing is central to discipleship. Point number four will be that healing is only possible through the cross of Jesus Christ. And point number five will be that the church is the agent of God to bring healing in a broken world. And number six, I will give a personal testimony. And number seven, we will conclude and we can go home. So, let's start with point number one. That God made healing central to the mission of Jesus Christ. I thank God that even after we messed up as human beings, he didn't leave us to sort out our mess. He decided to send his own son to come and mess our mess. But when he sent him, he gave him a specific mission to do and a specific job description. And this is what he read when he started his earthly ministry back in Luke chapter 4. And we are going to read the original, what Jesus was reading when he read the words we find in Luke chapter 4. And we will read from Isaiah 61 verse 1 to 3. This is what the word of God says. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. The, and he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. That, I love this, that, that they may be called ox of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. 
praise God. In this scripture, it shows us very clearly that Jesus in his mission, he was not only inspired, but also empowered by the Holy Spirit. But on top of that, he was anointed by the Lord, Yahweh. He was anointed for that. Let me tell you, when you are new in the city or in somewhere else and you fall sick and you need a doctor, you don't just walk to the nearest clinic. You first ask people around, which is the best clinic that can help me, that can serve me in my condition? And the people get to tell you, this one, that one, this doctor, he's a specialist in this, in this. What are you doing? You are looking for a qualified clinic with qualified doctors who can help you. And that blesses my heart to know that Jesus, when it comes to the ministry of healing, it's not something he came up on his own. It's not something he just did as entrepreneurship, but it's something he was inspired by the Spirit of God to do. He was empowered by the Spirit of God to do, and he was anointed by the Lord himself to go and do. So when you seek Jesus, hearing from Jesus, you are in the right place. There are other places you can go, and you may not get a good service, but to him, he is qualified because even his father confirmed it and say, I have put my Holy Spirit on him. I have empowered him and I have anointed him. So his mission is empowered. His mission is anointed. And that mission, let's look at it. What is the assignment that Jesus was given? There are so many things listed there. And I encourage each one of us, when you get time, just to spend time asking God to explain to you what those things mean. Let's read some of them. To bring good news to the poor. Some Bibles add to bring good news to the afflicted. And to bind up the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to those who are bound. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. And I love this exchange. Because you can't find it anywhere else in the world. Money cannot buy this exchange. But on the cross of Jesus, on, in Jesus alone, that's where we can bring our ashes. Where we are afflicted. Where we are in pain. Where we are in sorrow. And we tread that so that he may give us a beautiful headdress. A crown instead of ashes. That's the only place where you can bring your mooning and he gives you the oil of gladness. That's the only place you can give your faint spirit and then he gives you a garment of praise because he is the only one who can provide that. Remember he was anointed. Remember he was empowered. Remember he is inspired to do that work. Let's look at the outcome, meaning the goal of that mission of Jesus. The goal that Jesus has, it's in verse 3. It says that he may, they may be called ox of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And this ties in with the definition we had of healing. Because the reason God anointed Jesus to bring healing to us, it's not so that we may feel more comfortable, no longer in pain, no longer spending sleepless night. That also will happen, but it's a byproduct. But what he is looking for is to make us ox of righteousness planted by him, not by his story, not by wounding, but planted by him so that we may bring him glory. And we praise God for that. And I will come back to this in a minute in the next point. So we have established that hearing was central 
to the mission of Jesus. He didn't hear by chance or by, oh, 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 oh I happen to see people who are, healed, who are wounded, let me heal them. It was central to his mission. Did it end there? Or did he pass it on to his disciples? And that's the second point we want to look at. Hearing is central to the Great Commission. Turn with me to Luke chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. This is what Jesus said. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons. That's number one. Number two, to cure diseases. Number three, he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God. And number four, to heal the sick. When it comes to healing, when it comes to what God wants to do with the church, he first gave us power and he gave us authority. So if we are going to bring healing, we need to remember we are also empowered. We are also given authority to be able to do that. If you look at these four things that are mentioned here, whether it's to cure diseases, whether it's to cast out demons, whether to preach the kingdom of God, whether to even heal the sick, all of them have something in common. It's about freedom. It's about the restoration of God's order in someone's life. But the problem with the church today is that we are very selective. One church focuses on casting out demons. When you get there and you say, in Jesus' name, you can hear the whole church turning, amen. Hey, we change even the voice. Because our focus is casting out demons. I sometimes wonder whether we are not deceived to think that demons fear our death. That they, they, they have a problem with, with their ears. That makes us change the noise or the, the voice when it's time to cast them out. Even myself, you would hear me changing because of the demons. But let me remind you one thing. You don't have to do that. Because Jesus has given you power. He has given you authority. If you walk in that, you don't have to fear them. If somebody would have a problem here with the demon, you would see people going, oh my goodness, oh there are demons in CLA. But don't fear. You have power. You have authority. Some other churches, they choose maybe to focus on the kingdom, preaching the kingdom. But many stop on the kingdom, not of God, but on, of their own denomination. So we are very selective. But if we want to be effective, we need to embrace everything that Jesus has given us power and authority to go and do. And all of that is about the freedom and about the restoration that he wants to bring to his people. Number three, hearing is central to discipleship. If you go back to Isaiah 61, verse 3, that we were referring to earlier, you will see why Jesus wants to do all that work in us. And what, why, what is that reason? So that we may become Oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, so that we may, he may be glorified. And this is what I wanted to say on this point. The quality of the disciples we make depends on how much we help people who come to the Lord to sort out their past, to sort out their wounding. But we bring people in, 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 in the kingdom. We don't help them to sort out their past. And when they start messing up, we wonder, why is this person not, he's not saved. No, he's saved, but he's still a wounded person. Because the, 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 it's a reality that wounded people wound others. Hurt people hurt others. And I said this in other services. I will repeat it even here. This is paramount for CLA as a church, as a community. Because one of the things you are known about in this city is that you are a refuge for many people who have been hurt in other churches. 
So these people, they come here to find refuge. So if they stay here and they carry their wounds, one day they look at the pastor, they start comparing him with the other pastors. And then they start messing up. Not because they want to, but because you can only give what you have. If you have wounding, that's what you will pass on. They go in the cell, in home cells, then you realize they are starting to, to, to mess up. Not only them. Don't think you who grew up here, you are also safe. No, you also might need some healing. But the quality of discipleship depends also, not just on healing, but healing is key in making, producing acts of righteousness. Because if we don't get healed, it affects even our witness. There is nothing that hampers our witnesses, that hinders our witness than a wounded church, than a wounded community, than a wounded preacher, than a wounded pastor. Because we only give what we have. Let me say this scripture here. The Bible says a good person takes from the storage of his goodness inside, and that's what he gives. And the bad person, it's the same thing. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if somebody is wounding you, don't just judge them. Know that they are also wounded and pray for their healing. But there is nothing that hampers our witness as a church like wounding. Let me explain what I said. I come here, I am a preacher, I'm part of the church, and one day they spent like two weeks without giving me even a, a chance to, to be the host of the service. I say, oh, here they don't honor me, they don't like me, oh, I know how to preach, let me go start another church. Is God sending me, or it's my wounding sending me? It's my wounding sending me, and I know this firsthand. I have spoken to people who went to start churches just out of frustration, just out of wounding. And guess what? When they get there, things don't go well because there is no perfect church. If you see it, don't get into it because you will spoil it yourself because you are not perfect yourself. But our wounding makes us to start things that are not of God. Let me be practical even in our context here in Rwanda. It is said that 90, over 95% of Rwandese before the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi were Christians. How is that possible? How is that possible? But do you know what has happened? Yes, they were nominal Christians, but also they had also tested on the wounding. Because even the genocide ideology find if, finds a fertile uh, ground in the wounding of the people. Let me explain what I mean. Those who are old enough, over 30 maybe, will know, will remember what we used to learn at school in the history. They would teach you things that will paint a bad picture of a Tutsi. Even your friend you were playing with, you start going away feeling like, no, I can't associate with him. If it's like the way my teacher told me, I can't associate with him. The genocide ideology finds a fertile ground in wounding. Let me give an ex another example. We have cases of genocide survivors who ended up associating with those who killed them, why? Because someone else hurt them and their wounding makes them <laughs> illogical. They associate with those who have killed them. They start fighting. Hey, we want this, we want that. I'm not going to name names, but if you are old enough to remember the history, recent history of Rwanda, you will know what I'm talking about. A genocide survivor who is wounded it's not unusual to find that even his wounding may lead him to even become, uh, allow the genocide ideology to find a place in him. Because wounding is a terrible thing. 
Let me say something else. Wounding, it's like a landmine in the hands of the enemy that he will use one day, sometime in the future. I grew up, I get wounded in my family, maybe somebody rejects me, maybe it's my mom who traumatized me, and then I get married. I start looking at my wife through the lens of my mom. I start harassing her, you women, who, who, why are you always like that? And she doesn't have a clue of what has happened. But what has happened, my mom wounded me, nobody helped me to be healed, and then she's paying the price. Why she doesn't know? Let me say this, I said it earlier, let me say it here. When you look at the rate of divorce in this city, it's not just because we are now advanced, we are a now developed nation, no, it's not because we know our rights. That's not the reason. One of the main reasons is because we took two wounded people, put them in marriage, instead of putting them in an ambulance, taking them to the hospital. <laughs> we thought if we put them in a, in a, in a marriage, then they will, they will hear each other. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Because no one else will be your healer. Only Jesus is able to heal. So, a wounded community is a vulnerable community. If CLA is a wounded community and we don't deal with whatever has wounded us, CLA is vulnerable to the enemy. It takes just the enemy <laughs> to bring up something. I was telling some of uh, one of the other services how the enemy is very strategic. Have you noticed how when it's your turn to preach or to stand here, it's when your enemy comes to church. <laughs> Have you noticed that when you are about to preach, that's when the enemy will bring things to just take you out and not allow you. I know, I know because I have experienced it. Yesterday I was preparing this message and I received a phone call that really hurt me. And I said, oh, this is what you are doing, the enemy, but back off. I'm not going to fall into a trap. I know where to go to be healed. Because the enemy loves using wounding. He loves using it to mess us up. Let me say this. <laughs> After the genocide against the Tutsi, some people were asking, why, why, why people died in the church? Why did priests, pastors, and bishops also get involved? And one priest said this, that the blood of ethnicity became stronger than the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, without healing, eh, even this I'm saying, there are people who are wondering, how is this guy even able to talk about this? Don't worry. Jesus is able to heal, and he can heal you. But without wounding, the blood of ethnicity can run deeper than the blood of Jesus Christ. Let me continue. There was another example I was to give, but let me skip it for the sake of time. Healing is only possible through the cross of Jesus. That's point number four. Healing is only possible through the cross of Jesus. I know this point can sound controversial, but it's the truth. How is it possible that he is the only one in whom we can find healing? It's because he took on himself our sorrows, our grief, our pain, our sins, and everything. He took it on himself. He accepted to suffer. Remember, he is the creator. I am always amazed that when he was to be born, he didn't choose King Faisal. He went to be born in a manger. So that people like me, who were born somewhere near the Nyungwe forest, can also find hope in him. Because many of us, we were not born in hospital. So, but he accepted that so that we can, he can identify with us in our sicknesses, in our weaknesses. Remember his ministry. Remember, uh, let me even say this. Do you know he survived the genocide? 
so that he may be able to hear the pain of genocide survivors. Before he turned two years old, Herod said, we are killing all the uh, young boys below two years old, and he survived. He became even a refugee in Egypt, so that those who were refugees in 1999, in 1970 something, 60, even us who were refugees in 1994, in Tinji Tinji, we can also find hope in him. Because he is the only burden bearer. He is our only burden bearer. He is the one who took on himself our pain and our sins. I studied psychology. I know there are other things that can help you. Counseling, therapy, and so on. But this is what I declare with all my, 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 my strength. Healing is only possible through the cross of Jesus Christ. Healing is only possible through the cross of Jesus Christ. And fortunately, we don't believe it. If we did, we would run to him for healing. If we believed it, we would allow him to heal us so that we can be a channel of his healing to the hurting world. And that's point number five. The church is the agent to bring healing to a hurting world. The Bible calls us the salt of the world. Salt has a double property. Seasoning, but also healing. But what will we become if we lose our saltiness because we are not healed? Let me go to point number six. Talk about my personal story. I was born in this country. And history classified me as a Hutu. Before the genocide, I was very proud of being a Hutu. But after the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, it became a very, <laughs> a very different story. I ran away to Congo, stayed there in a refugee camp and in the forest for two and a half years, came back to die here in Rwanda. And I'm still alive as you can see. Let me even share some good news. I became born again, which is really amazing, but as a Hutu. You know, Rwandese, I'm sure you can understand what I'm saying, to be born again as a Hutu, which means you are very careful who you talk to. Even the Bible says, be shrewd as snakes. So we justify even our wounding. Why we, we can't associate, why we can't open up to other people. So I became like that. And then I was a preacher. I was carrying a lot of suspicion, a lot of fear, a lot of shame of being a Hutu while Hutus have committed the genocide. I remember during the commemoration in 2000 when I went to university at the Butare University, I used to hide my nose, not because I was suffering from any cold or any flu, just to hide so that nobody looks at my nose and thinks, oh, this guy is also a Hutu and he's associated with those who committed the genocide. I carried a lot of shame, yet I was a preacher. How effective was my ministry? How effective was my ministry? But I thank God that in the year 2001, I had the other side of this gospel, that Jesus did not die for my sins alone. He died for my pain. He died for my sorrow. And I gave him my shame, I gave him my fear, I gave him my suspicion, and I allowed him to make me his son. Not a Hutu son, but his son. I used to fear to even participate in the commemoration. That's the busiest time for me since 2001. Because God transformed me through the cross of Jesus, into someone who can bring comfort to other people. Not just my own people. I remember once asking God, how dare you call me a Hutu to be a preacher in a nation like Rwanda? But our God is a redeemer. 
He redeems even our dark history. He redeems even our pain. I never knew just being myself and sharing my story would bless anybody. But God said, no, I took away your pain. You go be the agent of healing to other people. And that's what God is calling you to be. And let me conclude by um, referring to the scripture that our pastor said at the end uh, before praying for us. Hebrews 4, chapter 16, verse 16, 14 to 16. We have a high priest who have ascended on high. And he was tempted in every way. And he is able to sympathize with us. Therefore, we can approach the throne of grace. We can approach the throne of grace. I challenge you, my brothers and sisters. Would you allow Jesus to hear you so that he can use you? Because we are all wounded in one way or another. Whether survivors, whether people who are associated with the perpetrators. Let me even speak to those who came from abroad, who came back to Rwanda in, uh, after the genocide uh, against the Tutsi. Sometimes you look at the Hutus and the Tutsis, uh, survivors, and you say, oh, you guys, you are the one who are wounded. How about you? How, what were you doing in Uganda? <laughs> Was it for studies that you lived there? Some of you, you had to change names. Some of you, you suffered in many ways. How about coming to Rwanda? A land that flows with honey and the milk, and you find it flowing with blood. That shock is enough for you to seek hearing to God, from God. And let's pray and ask God to really bring hearing to us so that we can become agent of his transformation. Let's take a moment of prayer. Would you ask God to search your heart? And show you what is really going on. Don't pretend. Don't cover it up. Put aside being a noble person. Yam Frishinja Jirishir. The noble who walks even while wounded. But be real with God. And tell him where you are wounded. Father, we come to you this afternoon as we are putting aside all pretense, putting aside all unreality, such as expose our wounding, not because you want to show people that we are bad, but because you want to heal us. We run to you, Jesus. We run to you across. Because that's where we can find healing. I pray for the old, for the young, that we will all find healing on the cross of Jesus. That's when you will make us agents of healing. When we are healed. When we have been comforted, we will be able to comfort other people. Because we can't give what we don't have. We trust you, Father. May you bless this congregation. May you bless the leadership. And may you bless this nation. Even those who are not Rwandese. I know, Lord, we all have our own struggles. Our own challenges. May you bring healing. May you bring restoration. Bless your people. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Apologies for going over time. I think preaching three services had a toll on me. I can assure you I didn't go over time in the first two services. So apologies. Please forgive me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Lambert, that is powerful. I hope you've got some nuggets of truth you can walk out with, some reflections. 
I want to throw this challenge to us and then we will cross. And uh, this is now about the church today. It's not about the church before the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. What are we doing to bring healing? What are we doing to embrace healing? Praise the Lord. A few reminders before we head out. Uh, man enough, if you are a man enough and you've not gone through that discipleship, remember to go and register right at the back. Those who came in late, uh, please feel free to go and give. There is a late offering slot lit right at my extreme left here. And then there is another uh, offering uh, box right at the exit. And those who want to use the POS machine, Jackie is right under the Master Ministry banner. Our visitors, don't just rush out. We have a team waiting to receive you in the hospitality lounge. Let's all stand up and share the words of the grace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of God be with us now and forever. Amen. May the Lord go ahead of you. Have a wonderful week. God bless you.